And we are live with another Freedom Friday. It is Friday and you still are not free. But the more you listen to us and join us on these Fridays, the freer you might be. I got my brother, uh, El Mecki. How you doing this morning? How you doing? Good man, doing well. Today's uh, the twenty first. I, I believe this is the uh, the anniversary of Nat Turner's rebellion. Yo, is it really? Uh, I, I, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, my mom put all these different calendar dates. You know, the dates that she thought was really important, she put on all her kids' uh, calendars and a bunch of other people. So I, I think I saw that uh, uh, last night. So that's an amazing yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, keeps you keeps you like, oh, OK, this is what. All right. When you talk about like honoring our ancestors, sitting and reflecting and all that. And I think it's very appropriate for this topic that we're talking about today. Oh, wow. You know, someone should some enterprising person listening to this or watching <laughs> this should go into Google right now, set up a Google calendar and little by little put all of the black past dates on the calendar. Like you're saying today, Nat Turner, like your mother has done, steal this idea and then link us all to that calendar. So mm -hmm. it's all on all of our Google calendars. So we wake up in the morning, we look at our phone, it pops up and says, Nat Turner's Rebellion. Uh, think about it. Yeah. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> think about it. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So what's the quick and dirty on on uh, on that? Before we get into our topic, let's just, you know, quick and dirty. What's maybe the, the, the 10 seconds, 20 seconds on Nat Turner's Rebellion? Yeah, well, Nat Turner, uh, you know, he was a preacher. And he thought that, you know, he had visions that, you know, he was anointed to, to help liberate black people. Mm -hmm. And he organized and organized. And and unlike many other rebellions, nobody snitched on him beforehand. Really? Or at least not before he started. You know, some mm -hmm. of the others mm -hmm. before they even, you know, uh, took place, they they got ratted out. But, uh, you know, he started a rebellion and I forget the exact number of, you know, he started at the plantation to where he used to be killed them he killed everybody in the house um and they really? kept mar they kept marching and they were basically like hey the idea was let's hit all these plantations up grab as many weapons as possible and more people will join us uh you know to liberate themselves and others uh they ended up being you know being killed they couldn't find nat turner and then they eventually found him um if anyone, you know, read the Confessions of Nat Turner is a, is a book out there that, you know, um, you might be interested in, in reading. And yeah, look him up, Nat Turner. A lot of folks are like, oh, how did he kill? Because some of the people he killed were children, white children. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, listen, they're going to they're going to they supposedly own us and they're going to grow up to be to continue this, uh, you know, uh, exploitation and, mm -hmm. and this system and uphold the system. So there's a lot of you know, conversations about like, oh, what, you know, how he did it, what he did. And, you know, I, I think it's worthy of, of debate. But, you know, we we mm -hmm. honor we honor his, uh, you know, his push for liberation um, today. Well, two things about Nat Turner. One, uh, when I was at the National Museum of African-American History in D.C., they have his Bible. And it was just weird to stand right in front of it, like it being right there, mm -hmm. like just looking at it and saying to yourself, like all pieces, all artifacts in that building to say Nat Turner owned that. That was mm -hmm. in his hand at some point. Here mm -hmm. I am looking at it. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say about it, I see Naomi Shelton is with us this morning here. Good morning, sis. Um, the thing with Naomi and uh, and you and me, and it might be a good show at some point to talk about the movie. Nat Turner's movie mm -hmm. that came and went and it had a little bit of controversy around it, but I, I feel like it was a missed op. It, it, it just like came and went. It was like yeah. a missed opportunity to have any discussion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to the point where I don't even know that any of us even ever talked about that movie when yeah. it came out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, definitely not in, I don't think it had any large, we took students to see it, you know, um, students at, at, uh, at Shoemaker. Um, shout out to the legendary shoe crew. Uh, <laughs> that'll borrow the roots intro. Yeah, they, uh, you know, um, we took in there we, and and actually the uh, the brother who, uh, what's his name, Nate, Nate Park. Mm, no, I know who you're talking about. Nate the one who got in trouble. The, yeah. The actor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So he was actually in town, um, you know, because he, I think he attended Penn State. So he was in town. Mm -hmm. So he, he had a conversation with our students about, 
you know, using art to to excavate stories and mm -hmm. and and to teach and um, and all that. And I thought the students were really, you know, they left inspired, smarter, um, and and you know, just I miss I miss that. Nate Parker is who Naomi yeah, says Nate he was. Nate Parker. Um, so I didn't know he went to to Penn State. I thought he had actually went to college. Um, anyway, so moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, today's conversation, today's topic, folks, is a deep and textured conversation that will not be ended today by us doing this, you know, having this interaction, but it's one that we need to have because it's it's uh, germane to uh, our past and our present. Today, we're talking about the black community and the relationship with white liberals. It's a longstanding relationship and partnership that has happened for years, uh, that has been in place for years. And there have been some political gains out of this partnership between blacks uh, who wanted their freedom, wanted black power, liberation, or were in the black struggle, however you want to term it and identify it, and saw as their allies white liberals who either had resources or time or um, some sort of investment in helping us um, to gain our freedom. Mm -hmm. I want to just kind of point out a couple of places in history, just as a setup, and we'll just dive right in after mm -hmm. this. We've been warned throughout time by black leaders and bl black people of letters to watch out for white liberals, though not to suck down everything that they give us and not to accept the fact that they want to help us, that because they want to help us, we should consider everything that they do for us good. Ida B. Wells is a good place to start. Ida B. Wells uh, became deeply suspicious of the white leaders and founders of the NAACP and she fell out of favor with the NAACP because of her suspicion for the motives and the type of dominance that the white leaders uh, wanted to bring to that organization. And she was one of the few people in the all the, the, the black universe of people of that time who were fiercely independent about the black fight for radical um, change and for, for, um, uh, for liberation. She remained so and she was ostracized in some ways and marginalized because she was uh, unrelenting in that analysis of the NAACP. One of her mentees was uh, uh, Du Bois. Mm -hmm. uh, du Bois was one of her mentees, also amongst the founding people of the NAACP, also someone who come, came to fall out of favor uh, with his analysis uh, uh, of white liberals, came, came out of their favor, um, eventually uh, had a rift between him and the NAACP too, and it was mostly around the white leadership and the driving forces behind the NAACP. Be interesting for folks to look for a paper by uh, Megan Ming Francis, uh, and it's about movement capture. And in that, she talks about the white funders that, um, that took over the NAACP in the early days and had them stop focusing on the thing that Ida B. Wells and others wanted them to focus on, which was uh, anti-black mob violence that was killing people across the country, um, and to start looking into education as their main thing, and specifically their focus on uh, how education should go, the white liberal focus on how it should go. That will become important later in our discussion today because we'll come, we'll circle back to that. Um, two other people, and El Mecki, I'm sure you're going to talk about um, one, two, or all of these. Mm -hmm. uh, in the letter from a Birmingham jail, there's mm -hmm. the famous line that um, Dr. King says, which is, we will remember the silence of our friends. And he's saying that we'll remember that more than our enemies. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that he's making this, uh, this, this duality between the conservative and the liberal, and he's focusing more on the liberal than the conservative. Almost as if the conservative, we know what they're supposed to do and, and what they think and how they feel about us. But the liberal is a more complicated um, friendship because they're frenemies. At times, they are friends that act as enemies. And in the letter from Birmingham Joe, you get that, that he is saying, um, basically, let me deal with you today in that letter. That's what he's saying in that letter. Today is your day. Let me talk about you today. And let's look at your house and clean it up a little bit. And then Malcolm X uh, did the same thing. Uh, he basically said that um, liberals are the enemy of black progress. 
He basically said that there are no Republicans and Democrats. There are only two groups of white people, conservatives and liberals. And when it comes to the conservatives, I can respect them because they're honest about who they are and they're straight up about who, how they feel about you. And that allows you to work within an intelligent universe where logic makes sense. But he said the smiling foxes on the left, the white liberals are super problematic because they make you think they have your best interest in mind. They come around and talk about how sympathetic they are to your causes. And they, they work with you in every way possible to get your allegiance and loyalty. And then they're only doing it to use you as a football in a game of football, uh, to use you as a football in a game of football between them and the conservatives. They're just really doing it to use you as kind of a tool in their fight against the other group of white people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's my setup, man. You know, um, Ida B. Wells, Du Bois, MLK, Malcolm X, somewhere in there, Stokely Car Carmichael said the same thing to, to oh, yeah. folks. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Garvey said the same thing. Uh, Elijah Muhammad, over time, we have been warned yeah. um, by black voices in history, beware the white liberal. All right. <laughs> There we go. So so let's head off, man. What's up, man? Uh, I think it's a worthy topic because these things, you know, uh, lessons don't change in life until you learn from them and you fix them. If not, it's just going to keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. You see the spanning over a decade. I want to read something from a white man um, who wrote a, a book called uh, Liberal Racism. And he said his, his name is... Uh, is uh, Jesse, Jim Sleeper, sorry, Jim Sleeper. Li the liberal racial doctrine no longer curbs discrimination. It actually invites it. It does not expose racism. It recapitulates it and sometimes reinvents it, right? And so what he's talking about is like, it's not, it doesn't go away. And and you can't expect the liberals to to actually end it because ultimately, they still benefit from it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they mm -hmm. benefit from it. So it's hard for them to see how do I end this and still maintain my perceived, you know, mentally, but physically, uh, you know, economic superiority, right? Like, mm -hmm. how do I still, how do I, you know, they're like, I, I love how Stokely Carmichael talks about this. He says, you know, white liberals are the folks who will see a gun being held to somebody, right? So just imagine, you, you know, the white liberals across the street, he sees two people, one holding a gun to the other. Instead of him figuring out how to disarm or get help in disarming the the uh, the assailant, he goes around and tells the person that's that's being assaulted, I support you. But let me find a way for you to be more comfortable mm -hmm. at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. That's what white liberalism often is. Let me see how I can get black people to be more comfortable at gunpoint. <laughs> Forget the gun. I don't want to address the gun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's actually my that's my cousin. I don't I don't want to address him. But let me make sure you're comfortable in this in this traumatic experience called America. When Stokely tells that story, he says what you just said exactly. Like you're walking down the street, you see two people, one's got a gun on the other, and you want to help. And he said, Um, I want to help the guy that's got the gun on him. But if I walk up and I try and join him as somebody who has a gun on both of us, that's not helping. That's not helping at all. What helps is if I get a gun and shoot the other person, <laughs> now, now I've helped both of us out of the situation. And he's like, until white people are willing to be that guy with their own people instead of coming to fix us. Like, mm -hmm. We don't need the fixing. We got a gun on us. We don't yeah. need fixing. We need you to come and get this dude's neck or knee out of our neck. And you might have to put a knee on his neck to help me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I think is interesting is a it's a it's it's a very <laughs> stark example to give yeah. the story yeah. as a storytelling. But um, what I thought was interesting about it was that mandate: if you really want to help, show me how much you want to help. Yeah, go and take care of your own people, and then come back and tell me how it worked out. Uh, in some ways, it feels like conservatives and racists and the whites that are are really oppressive are more powerful than the folks that come to help us. The folks that come to help us are weak and kind of namby-pamby and milk toast, and 
you know, I just saw three nights of it on on the DNC's convention of, well, you know, let's love each other, let's all be together, just together, together, we're together, you know. And I'm thinking, some of well, some of us are together, <laughs> some of y'all ain't together. Yeah, I mean, but you know why those conservatives and those people, you know, the 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 visually hateful groups, why they're so powerful? Because so many uh, of the white liberals give them power. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they, they give them that extra thing. You know, when um. You know, I wrote this for the 74 uh, a while ago about, you know, the, uh, 1954, um, you know, Brown versus Board. And so, you know, the Supreme, you know, the president at, at the time talked about like, hey, you know, those Southerners. And then you're this is going to sound familiar. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the premise, those Southerners, they're not that bad. You know, he was talking to uh, one of the, the Supreme Court justices. Um they're not that bad. When they say they don't want integrated schools, they just don't want that big black buck sitting next to their precious daughter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So while the Southerner says that out loud, the Northerners, they got white flight in northern cities with so-called bastions of liberalism. Right. Like they're saying the same thing. They just mm -hmm. they're doing it with their feet. They're doing it with their policies. They're doing it with their economics. They're saying the exact same thing. That's why you can have in the integrated neighborhoods. That K to two, K to second grade, it's integrated. You look at it, you're like, wow, this is what they were talking about. Let that go look at that fourth, fifth grade classroom. And you're like, where all the white people go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> where they, mm -hmm. parents are like, nah, I don't want you, sit, my kids sitting next to you, Negro. Right. But they're at the same time, they'll, they'll have a flag, a Black Lives Matter flag in their lawn. They'll be at the protest. Ask them where their kids go to school. Ask I mean, them where they live and where their kids go to school story of uh detroit um massive 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 outflux of white people this is northern city detroit mm -hmm. uh massive outflux of um white people when desegregation hit now chicago or detroit's a different city same thing with chicago same thing with gary indiana same thing with milwaukee we can keep going down the list of northern cities that were once kind of you know uh industrial hubs of progress mm -hmm. and progressive you know um politics um, and all the way up until today, I'm still, you know, hammering on a report that we did that shows that progressive cities have a real problem with educating black children, Seattle, San Francisco, Oakland, um, Austin, the twin cities, um, these other places that I mentioned, Chicago and Detroit and others, um, all progressive leadership, lots of progressive black leadership who are anointed and propped up by white liberals. Mm -hmm. Like, let's be real, white liberals are doing a very good job of choosing our leaders, mm -hmm. choosing our speakers, choosing who gets to be in the room and who doesn't get to be in the room. And if we were to like make this about education, so we're talking about white liberalism and the black community, but you and I focus on education as our primary, um, our pr primary topic and issue, right? Right, right. Tell me if this is wrong. My Here's my primary analysis of public education and liberalism. Um, the system itself is actually run by and most coveted by white liberals. Mm -hmm. um, the primary stakeholders in public education are the public employees, the folks I call pensionistas, and the majority of them are white. The majority of the stakeholders, if you want to look at a changing a system, you have to first look at who's the, mo the primary stakeholder of that system because that's who's going to be your biggest problem. The primary stakeholder in public education as a $700 billion system are the public employees that populate it and make a living off of it and pay their mortgages off of it. And that is, for better or worse, you know, worse of terms, pensionistas, the public employees. Uh -huh. They collect and bundle their money into a thing called a union, and that union overrides democracy by buying politicians, buying elections, uh, populating school boards with the people that they want on it, and their their primary partnership and allies that keep them politically sound are with white women outside of public education, the mothers of the kids who feel very well taken care of by the public education system and the white teachers in that system. The dominant culture partner parents. That's who are the, that's who their their public um, partnership is with, and that gives you things like. Save Our Schools, Parents Across America, the Network for Public Education, all of the associated and allied groups to teachers unions, right? 
And that also gives you a wide number of employed people in things like the Center for uh, um, um, Popular Media and in the public interest and the Education Law Center and all these other kind of front groups that are funded by the pensionistas, right? And then they pick our black leaders. So some of them go find our village idiot in, it, in every city and prop that person up as the real grassroots person who's gonna keep it real. Let me keep it real, y'all. All we need is to stay in these systems. That's all we need. Oh yeah, really sister, who invited you here to this? Oh, this group funded by the teachers union, the pensionistas and the dominant culture partners, which are the white parents that support them. And then they attack us as, you know, if we say anything about getting out of the system, moving away from the system, freeing a mind from the system, one black person, one black head, one black sheep, anybody to get out of the system, they pull the same thing they pulled on King with the, the Birmingham thing, which is to say, you're an outside agitator. Uh -huh. They called him uh, an agitator who was a communist. They call us outside agitators who are corporatists, right? Uh -huh. It's the same. It's the same way you slime. Anybody wants to free themselves. Um, <laughs> same way you slime. <laughs> this is the same way you slime people. They slimed him and one. Oh, you just come in from the outside. Why are you even here? Why are you even in Birmingham? Who's paying you to be here? Who are you working for? You working for Stalin? And it's the same thing. People come around now and say, like, listen, y'all, y'all don't got to go to these schools. You do know that some of y'all like, you know, we's free. <laughs> some of y'all could go to a different school if you wanted to. Shh, don't don't tell nobody. Oh, you're a corporatist, neoliberal, privatizer. Oh, my God. Well, who, who, wait a second now. Who wrote that talking point? Oh, the pensionistas. They sent us a, they sent us a memo telling us. That that you have to, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, there's my long winded call out. What do you say? Listen, I, Minnesota and Pennsylvania, and I've said this a lot of times, and I'll, I'll keep saying it, you know, uh, the fact that 96% of the teachers are white is astounding and it's not. Right. It's, uh, you know, and it's, you know, a lot of times when I talk about it, a lot of times people, they get the point that that it's, you know, we need more role models and so on and so forth. But for me, that's that's a part of it. Yes. Like who's in front of the kids, the quieter but bigger, large concern for me is that 96 percent influences policy. Mm -hmm. That's the part that that, you know that I get scared about the most, you know, yes, the person in front of kid and the damage uh, that can be done or the brilliance that can be produced. That's one thing. But I think there are other ways we can, you know, mitigate that if we're organized and, and approach it. Right. You know, we talked about these detox centers once you leave school, no matter what what's going on inside of school. But the policy, so much of that is, you know, behind the scenes. Right. Um, and then the law. Right. So it influences both. And, and you know, policy can just keep getting changed, you know, overnight behind closed doors at secret meetings. All you need is some signatures to change policy, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And so that can happen over and over and over again. And next thing you know, it's like, wait a minute, how do we get to this point? And so that, you know, you, you said this a long time ago, and I've used it a lot uh, since then, that, you know, white liberals will lock arms with black folks and tell them, Hey, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we're all in the same boat. We're all in yep. this together. Yep. Right. But meanwhile, you're really not. <laughs> some people, we're all in the same water. Yeah. But, but some are drowning and others are in a yacht singing hymns and 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 and, <laughs> and hashtagging, right? <laughs> you know, wine in one hand with a with an olive. I don't know what the martini with a martini in one hand, and the, and they're you know, their smartphone in the other. Re, you know, recycling, you know, hashtags, <laughs> you know, we're the same water, not the same boat at by far. And when, and they know that, you know, they know that. And so that's, you know, that's part of the, the scariness of this outsized influence that, you know, one group has most of them, you know, mostly vast majority are white and, and many are, are, are white women. Right. And yeah. so if they if if people actually looked at black people, brown people, oppressed people as their equals, then that means they would give away something that they have, particularly power. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to do it like at the end of the day. They're not when when uh, Stokely, you know, uh, two of those quotes that I just, uh, you know, love where that I think are appropriate here. You know, one, he said, we're going to stop talking about freedom and we're going to talk more about power. 
black power. Yeah. Right. He's like, let's stop yeah. talking about yeah. freedom because they're, they're like, yeah, freedom. Yeah. Freedom. Yeah. We, we need freedom. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We saw the same thing. Let, let's, let's peel it back. We're always bringing up historical issues, right? The Quaker, a lot of people don't realize Quakers at one point owned slaves. Mm. And at some point, some of their, you know, uh, activists within the church said like, Hey, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so they, they made it, you know, you know, uh, illegal, so to speak, religiously. There's like, hey, if you're a Quaker, if you abide by our interpretation of the Bible, you cannot own another human being. So many of them, you know, they they helped in different ways. But when you read some of the, the stories, what came, comes out sometimes is we don't look at you as our equal, even if we don't think you should be enslaved. Mm. I don't know this history about Quakers. Quakers are my people. Yeah, no, they are. And I don't know this about this. I don't know this about yeah, it wasn't always look that up. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't always looked at as like you are equal as a human mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. Right. But I'm going to help get you free. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Those are two very different levels of thing. And, with, and today we have people who say like, hey, you might I disagree with mass incarceration, but I don't necessarily think you should get the same education as my child. Well, I think isn't that the same thing that the pensionistas are offering us? Um we want you to get an education in the buildings where we can make money off of you. We want you to be free to have an education. That's why we're going to fight for more fun, more money, more funding. So you can stay in the buildings in which we have the dominant um, control and power over it. We don't want you to have the power to run your own schools, have your own kind of educational program, decide anything really of value. We want to give you nominal power, like the ability to vote for somebody we tell you to vote for on the school board who will fight for more funding so that our pensions stay so solid. Um, but let's real power, mm -hmm. equal power would be to say, um, well, first of all, let's just start with, you know, um, the leader of the white woman movement, um, what I call the new Jane Crow. I have something that I'm writing right now that I'm about to put out about this. And the leader of that is, is that the, the Susan B. Anthony of the new Jane Crow is Diane Ravitch and Carol Burris and the nation nationwide network of white women who are about their age, who look a lot like them, who are college educated, middle class, have grandchildren going to Tony, either private schools or suburban schools or schools where there are no, uh, there's only a handful of black kids or whatnot. They're doing basically kind of well and their job is to run cover for the system and anybody trying to escape they become the imperial white mother to the the patriarchal white oppressor that we're supposed to fear so much we don't talk about the imperial white mother who has always existed existed in the house during slavery existed in the suffrage movement when they said that black men shouldn't get the vote before white women existed in in the white feminist movement when they tried to co-op black women to hate black men just the imperial white mother has been a partner a dominant partner to the patriarchal white man that we're supposed to all hate and fear and the leader of that new temperance movement, the new temperance movement, or the new white woman's movement, or the new Susan B. Anthony movement really is save our schools. Hands across America, save our schools, parents across America, the PTAs, the social structure of white female power that dominates what happens with black children, especially black boys, um, is our problem in education. You think I'm making too much of that? No, listen, you know, uh, and one of the I, I liked how you went down the sequence of, you know, uh, the suffragists and, you know, because it's all it's all, you know, related. And, you know, important part of that piece was at one point, you know, one, yes, they were angry uh, that men, you know, black men got to vote, even if they would be killed when they you know tried it. Right. But another part of that was and, and you mentioned the the white black alliance, you know, around women that happened initially was. You know, once a emancipation movement, right? They were abolitionists, and they said, "Hey, now let's focus on on women's voting." At some point, the the white suffragist leaders said, "You know what? For this to be uh, digestible for white America, we need to separate. We shouldn't ask for black women to uh, mm -hmm. given to be given the right to vote too. We should separate that and say later for them, we white women need the right to vote." Right. And they said America will appreciate that more. They'll get beyond this more. So that that loyalty that, you know, people think that they may have, they got to look deeply. 
right? Mm-hmm. Because you know, they, I I remember as a, as a kid, I, I forget when when Roots came out. It was probably like seventy six, seventy seven. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Listen, when Kizzy was a Kizzy grew up, thinking you know, <laughs> Kunta and his wife would say, "Hey, don't trust her." It was it was the the young lady of the plant the the plantation owner's daughter. Mm-hmm. Same age as Kizzy or around the same age. And they playing kids like, that's my friend. That's my, they like, stop it. Don't tr- <laughs> public, public enemy said, don't trust it. He said, don't, don't do it. That's, yeah. that's not your friend. And mm-hmm. sure enough, when Kizzy got sold, she was calling her friend. She called her by name. And in the, in the movie, it depicts the, her looking out at the window and like, oh, well, you know, and you, you know what Kizzy was guilty of trying to help somebody get free. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. That that moment, trying to help somebody get free, that that so called friendship evaporated. Mm-hmm. It blew up, and and she looked out the window. Is like you getting what you deserve. You you should be punished because mm-hmm. you you sought freedom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you sought freedom. There's no faster way to get kicked out of a uh, a union organized community grassroots meeting than to start talking positively about the charter school that you're in or the choice program that you participate in. I have watched because I've been in this work for so long. I've watched directly people be coached out of saying positive things about anything that their union organizers disagree with. And, you know, listen, I'm oftentimes talking about a 26 year old white girl who got out of college and started organizing for the union as a paid organizer in the grassroots who nobody knows that that's their primary job. And they show up at all the meetings and they have one on ones. Just want to have a one on one with you with coffee. You know, can we just like meet and have a one on one? They have a one on one and they take all the little beautiful notes. And in their notes, they tell you whether or not you're a one, a two, a three, a four or a five. The closer you are to a five, that means you're a full on village idiot and they can mold you into what they want you to be. If you're a one or a two, you're kind of problematic. You have some problematic ideas and they won't come back to you again. So they have hundreds of one-on-ones. That's like part of the organizing process, hundreds of one-on-ones and they rate you on a one to five in those one-on-ones and all the fives, they will come back to you and you will eventually have your ass up in a national forum with a shirt that says F charters on it, asking a question (laughs) of a presidential candidate. How did you, how did you find her? In this in a city that's the worst place for black kids to be educated, right? Like in that's in that city, you're you what you're talking about is F charters, right? Like in mm-hmm. like no mm-hmm. context, no understanding right. of of history, of the moment, of the 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 dire pain, your whole thing. And listen, when I was younger and naive, I just thought union folks hated all charters. It was mm-hmm. it was I, some maturation, you know, professional maturation when I realized. Oh, if the charter is actually unionized, y'all good with it. <laughs> if, if it increases your membership and your bank account, you're all good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's only if they're not unionized <laughs> is when you have a problem with it, you know, but it's under that part is hidden. Right. Just be transparent. Be like the conservatives and just say, hey, we hate y'all unless you are unionized because we need that. We need those dues. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. I'd, I'd respect that. I'd know exactly where the lines are drawn. And I, I would, but instead, it's like Black Lives Matter, it's, it's and mass incarceration, and food deserts, healthy food, healthy snacks, less environmental. Put grass on your roof, and don't you know? But don't talk about this yeah. education outside of our system, right? Like it's, nope. it's, I mean, it's, it's a exercise of silliness, you know, when you when you look about it, at it and think about it, right? But it's actually really effective. I, I know why they do it. It's a it, they have learned over time a perfect power move uh-huh. is to do exactly what we're saying. They know they can't say these things themselves, so they have to find the people within our community who know so little, like the low information voter, black voter, who they can say, like, you know, there's an evil force outside of us that's coming to try and take away your beautiful, awesome, lovely public school that has done so well by you for so long. You can't let that happen, you know. And and what Mal- what Malcolm says in his piece is. You're so uh, busy running from the jaws of the wolf that you jump right into the jaws of the fox, right? So the the Bull Connors of the world and the the white conservative who's like the the boogeyman, 
Um, you're so busy making that the boogeyman and running from him that the fox comes up to you and says, you can't let that happen. Oh, my <laughs> God. You you know, like run from that guy. Come right into my building. Let's the voice is one of those uh, uh, cartoons. You're like, right? Not that. Don't let that happen. Don't you know? let that happen. Come I'm to my fox. own my yeah. house in the woods. <laughs> Come be foxy with me, right? Like, you know, put on this T-shirt. Well, what's the T-shirt say? It says F charter schools. Well, now, see, that seems kind of funny because we have a really bad system of education. We've got a lot of black people running charter schools and in charter schools, teaching in them and got kids in them. Seems like kind of a weird t-shirt for me to wear. Shouldn't I wear a t-shirt that says F pensionistas since y'all the one holding us hostage for our per pupil income? Seems a little weird. Well, that's the fox and that, you know, like, listen, if I'm looking at the wolf and the fox, it's a good fight for me to watch because the fox is going to tell the truth about the wolf. But the wolf is also going to tell the truth about the fox. So if you're a passive bypass or a bystander, just listen to both their arguments about each other and you'll eventually end up with the truth. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's one. That's. Listen, <laughs> <We're, we're, laughs> that's telling us. This is exactly what he was saying. You know, when he, and when you talk about like this, the slickster, and you know, and particularly when you think about like the, the fox in in African lore. Right. You know, Aesop fables or wherever. Right. Like right. It, it's cunning. You know, and so we, you know, like people have to understand the cunningness in in all of these conversations and like what people want you to think, what you, you know, they'll say like we stand together for if you're standing together with a lot of these white liberals, what that really means is you're standing still. Mm -hmm. That's what they mean by stand together. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, no, no, just stand here. Just stand. You, you, you stand so long. You growing roots. You became a tree. You just like planted there. Like, you know, oh, oh my yeah. kids aren't educated. Oh, next generation. Oh, my kids. You still standing in the same spot, holding hands with that same person. While in the meantime, you think they holding the hand. They, they gave you one of those prostheses. <laughs> you, you hold it down. <laughs> they out with a racist, you know, <laughs> like, like they, they gone. They done. You sit, still stay there holding. You better, you better turn your head around and, and look at what's happening. They didn't even let you in on the first meeting. Save Our Schools have meetings that are all white women in those meetings. And they eventually ask questions like, well, do we know any people of color who understand this or that or the other? Well, I'll bring one to my next meeting and blah, 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 blah. I I got, I, I got one of those. I got one of those. those. Yeah, in my network. Oh, there's this one. She's great. She says the most erratic, crazy shit all the time in school board meetings. I'll go meet with her because she's a complete dimwit. And I'll be able to like fashion, refashion her, uh, get her a grant, and actually make her the spokesperson in Seattle for this uh, mm -hmm. particular, for our movement or whatnot. No irony whatsoever. Like you look at their networks, you look at their boards. They start out all white. Eventually, someone criticizes them, and they end up with one person, two persons, two people of color, three people of color here, or there. Very carefully curated people. Nobody who's ever going to challenge them mm. ever turn around and say, "Well, you know, your critique of privatizers is, is actually, you know, pretty compelling. It's spot on in a lot of ways." Yeah, you know, you talking about the wolf in ways that make that resonate with me. Now, can we talk about the fox? Mm -hmm. uh, can, can we can we talk about this fox just a little bit? And the answer to that will be, yeah, well, no, see, you can't say that because, you know, our open society grant will get cut if you jump out there saying that stuff. Like, we don't need all that type of action. Mm -hmm. Can I bring up philanthropy in this? Because this is, I think, important in education with the white liberal, right? So if you go back to what I call the Black Alamo in Black education history, which was mm -hmm. Ocean Hill, Brownsville, mm -hmm. the fight between the Black community and uh, Al Shanker, to um, to form black community based schools run by black people, governed by black people with teachers that they chose who half of, by the way, were um, Jewish teachers that were helping them. The Ford Foundation on in that battle between Al Shanker, the teachers union and the black community was funding the black community to um, fight for their rights to fight for community-based schools, to fight for black schools, to fight for uh, their own control of schools in an era where everybody was saying, don't control your own schools, just integrate. And the community got tired of that. They're mm -hmm. like, we're tired of waiting, it's not coming. Ford Foundation funded them in that battle to a very large extent. Took a lot of heat for doing it, mm -hmm. you know, funding black militants or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Al Shanker became famous by crushing the black community there at that point in time. And he became famous by getting white teachers um, to hate actually the idea of community control in the hands of black people. And his, his liberal solution was to say, 
we will grow our own black teachers. We will fight them and not let them get their own power. But what we will do is take our, um, our teacher aides and get them training so that they become our new union members and we will grow our own black teachers in our image. That was the liberal solution. And then he went across the country teaching other uh, communities how to put down black militants, mm -hmm. how to like fight black militants and, and, and beat them politically. And one core way to do that was to get the white people all lined up first. Bruh. Like to get the white families and everybody. So, so let me just say this one last part. No, no. So I'm just, I'm just agreeing with, I'm like, yes, preach. So Ford <laughs> Foundation actually switched at some point after that bruising incident and became a hundred percent teachers union funding. So today when people stand up and give us a hard time about our funding, there's a good chance that they're Ford Foundation funded and they fund exclusively like the, the, the example I could give you in Minnesota is the white program officer from Ford Foundation talks to one of two white people in Minnesota who then find all the people of color that they're going to fund underneath those two white people who curate, carefully curate for the right ideology, right? Mm -hmm. The right ideas about these things. And it's 100 percent anti-choice, anti-charter, anti-whatever Last I checked, Ford Foundation is a billionaire foundation, just like Open Society and the others who fund the anti-choice movement and the anti-charter movement. But why are we spending so much time talking about our funding? Hmm. Right. Well, people will say, like, listen, both of y'all just using black people, the wolf and the fox, the wolf and the fox are using black people. And my response to that will be, OK, so if the wolf and the fox are bringing you both a proposal. And one of the proposals says you will have more options. And the other proposal says that you will have fewer options. Who do you who do you go with? The wolf or the fox? You tell me, which one do you go with? I'm, I'm about more options because from there I can figure out what's my, you know, what's my escape hatch. You know, there's one way in, one way out. That's that's a bad move. That's a bad move. I mean, um, listen. And you, when you talk about Al Shanker, you, when you look at the history of America, like, you know, one of the fastest ways to become, because not only was he famous, he was a hero, right? Because it's one thing if just everybody, mm -hmm. it's another thing if they revere you. And mm -hmm. one of the fastest ways that America has shown to become revered is to try to crush black and brown people. That's mm -hmm. when you become lionized, you know, in so many different ways. Right. And so and people don't look at like, wait a minute, how did this become? Was it were you lionized because you were, you know, um, fighting for, you know, the freedom of black people or were you finding ways to suppress it? Mm -hmm. you know, there's there's only one way you're going to get lionized by the community, by the grassroots, by black people who are, you know, who are like struggling, you know, to, to survive, struggling for their children. It's another mm -hmm. one where those same people that you say, like they're sitting in a yacht talking about we all in the same uh, boat, in the same boat. Right. <laughs> we are and, in the same boat, except for I'm serving in the boat. Your ass is sitting yeah. there with the champagne. <laughs> if you if you exactly if you make it on that boat, exactly. You, you're in the bottom <laughs> or you're cleaning the hole or something. But, you know, absolutely, man. And, you know, with one of the th one of the things that I that I loved about uh, Dr. King's message, and I think, you know, I know a lot of people read it in high school. I, I want them to read it, you know, a couple of times while they're mm -hmm. in high school. Mm -hmm. I'd want them to read it one just to make sure, you know, the comprehension is there. Like, what is he saying? Then I'd want them to read it again for a different purpose, like a different purpose for reading. The second time that they read it, um, and the third and subsequently after that, I want them to overlay, you know, historical uh, issues where it's it's relevant. He wrote that a long time ago. It's relevant. Uh, you know, as we say, he could have written that this morning. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. could have written that this morning. That's mm -hmm. that's the painful part. But it's also the beauty of it. Right. Like because his words ring true and it gives us a blueprint. Right. And then if, if people don't know, like research, like how that was written. He was in jail, right? And so people think like, oh, jails have libraries. So maybe mm -hmm. he was in the library yeah. just writing this down. Mm -hmm. Like people were smuggling little pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. Think about a newspaper. He's writing in the margins. They didn't want his his words to get out, right? They locked him down for a reason. He this stuff is getting smuggled out and people are deciphering it like, oh, what did he what did he write there? Like all of that. Like that's that's how one, how livid he was with mm -hmm. his so-called friends. Right. Who said this isn't the right time. And they wanted you to wait. You'll wait so long for freedom that you'll end up in a coma. <laughs> right. Like you, you will just be sitting there passive, 
waiting, saying now's not the right time. Oh, the next time, you know, like, and when you think about like justice, you can't wait. <laughs> it can't wait. Like you, you know what I every, hear in that Sharif, as you say that waiting mm -hmm. is the big theme of that letter. Like wait is the big theme. And he, the big thing he's pushing him back against is the waiting. Like, no, yeah. no, we've waited yeah. too long. We've waited too long. We've heard that yeah. forever. And we're still, <laughs> but we're still hearing people, white yeah. liberals tell us to wait, <laughs> just wait for more money. In just education, wait, just, they're definitely telling us. Yeah, to wait. They're like, just wait for the next yeah. president. <laughs> just in, wait for the next uh, the Title One reform. Yeah. Just, instead of you know like looking for an option or an escape hatch, I've heard them say escape hatch. Instead of trying to escape these schools, why don't you just stay and make them better, mm -hmm. or wait for them to become better? Wait, 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 and you're like, well, damn it, you're not waiting. And I'm, and you're listen, not waiting. And if, if if you're telling me to wait and make them better myself, a la uh, Elizabeth Warren, you know, uh, while oh, she, God, she you know, oh, while she uh, got in her, you know, the fastest mm -hmm. uh, vehicle mm -hmm. moving to get her kid mm -hmm. out of that neighborhood where she worked, um, then give me, you know, stop fighting me with the, you know, to have the power. I can I can mm -hmm. go to that school. I can stay here. Let me have the power to fix it. Let me have the power. They want you to stay away and don't want to give you any of the power. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's the issue. Right? They're like, no, we're going to hold the power over here. You just go in there and wait. Listen, in Islam, it's a saying. It's a, you know, the worker should be paid before the sweat dries on his forehead. Mm. Mm, I like that. The worker should be paid before the sweat dries. Like, that's how immediate. Mm -hmm. So if we look at that in the context of justice. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. And the, the sweat, the blood, the tears, one, they never dry because they are they've been flowing for 400 That's years. That's why we never get paid. <laughs> that may be it's never like, dry. And they never dry. <laughs> the sweat's never yeah. dry. That's it. Listen, this picture I put up right here is our, yeah. our dude Al Shanker and uh -huh. Bayard Rustin. And this could be a totally different show that we could talk about this relationship. We but can. this is Bayard Rustin. Look at this sea of white people, right? Uh -huh. And this is, you know how uh Trump at some point said, uh, look at my my beautiful African American over there, <laughs> right? In his look thing. At my guy. Look at my, look black, at my guy. black guy over there. That's exactly what Bayard Rustin has. And people are gonna hate me for this as they watch this or they talk about this because you cannot talk about Bayard Rustin, right? Uh -huh. Like he's he's uh -huh. a especially in labor history and in white progressive history. This is one of their patron saints and blah, blah. Baird Rustin was one of the biggest sellouts of the civil rights movement. He, he, the things that he whispered into King's ear were the wrong things. He was anti-woman <laughs> and, and people don't know about this. He was the one who planned it so that women would have to walk from the back and not have a major um, place on the stage with all the, all the men. That was Baird Rustin, 110%. And he also was Shanker's man. And he was always in white rooms with the white folks and then come back to the black rooms and say, integration is the only way. Um, you know, the unionism is the only way. Joining with the white folks is the only way. And this, look, this is a perfect example right here of the role that Bayard Rustin played in, in civil rights. People should go and look for uh, a debate that he did with Malcolm X debating integration. And you will see the two sides of the House Negro and the Field Negro in that particular debate. It's just as clear as possible as you can take a look at it. But this is a model for all that came afterwards with white liberals. You always find your Baird Rustin, right? Now, let me tell you just two stories from history real quick. Mm -hmm. um, Humphrey, um, Humphrey uh, and, and other white uh, Democrats were afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer's disrupting what they had going on. And they told Roy Wilkins to handle it. Roy Wilkins is a Northern Minnesota black man in a suit who's college educated and has dinner and tea and coffee with them on a regular basis. Fannie Lou Hamer is a black woman from the South who keeps it plain, keeps it real and is getting too much press coverage. And she to, and, and Roy Wilkins sent message to, to, to her his message was tell that ignorant woman to go back down south, uh -huh. right? And uh -huh. he was saying that on behalf of Humphrey and others, basically like we got this, right? All the way up until the point where she got national attention uh, for, for um, preempting the president even and was seen and heard in a way that Roy Wilkins never was. King wanted to offer his seat in the Democratic delegation to her and the labor leaders told him that he needed to sit down and shut up. And that's exactly what he did. Right. Mm -hmm. That should tell you all that you need to know about this picture mm -hmm. and about the King picture and about Philip A. Randolph and their relationship with these folks and the labor movement or whatnot. Be real about your history, people. 
Like understand your history. Do not let them sell you uh, on these stories of we've all been in the same boat. We've been working together, you know, the labor uh, movement and all that type of um, revisionist history that doesn't really work for us. Anyways, um, we got about 10 minutes here. What should we land on? Because I know like we have so much more to say and there are things that that actually I wanted to to kind of land on. But so far we have talked about the 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 voices in the past who have warned us. Uh -huh. They have warned us about white liberalism and white liberals. They haven't warned us to stop working with them all together. Uh -huh. And they haven't warned warned us to love the conservatives. Uh -huh. But they have basically said the conservatives are honest people. <laughs> yeah. Conservatives, you will not have to spend as much time worrying about conservatives because they're honest people, simply honest people. Yeah. And people shouldn't shouldn't take that as like some kind of endorsement for, you know, <laughs> for for that. What they're saying is like, as you said, they're they're telling the truth. They're, they're telling you where they stand. They're telling you where they stand. And and as uh who's that? Maya said, you know, when people uh say who they, who they are, are. so yes. they are you know believe them the first time you know not the tenth time they're like hey i'm a snake hey i'm a snake hey i'm a snake they like believe them the first time but if if you just say oh yeah i think this is part of like you can't just be against things right because if you're just against what the conservatives say that means you may fall for everything else Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, and, and I think this is a part of where the, the black nationalists, you know, from Marcus, uh, you know, Garvey, um, you know, RBG, you know, all the way up until, you know, uh, the 60s and, and the 70s. Like what they were saying is like both of the we need a third way. <laughs> the third way centers us, our voice, our experiences, our vision for for what America uh, can be and should be um at least our part of it you know mm -hmm. um and it, without that then it gets it gets lost it gets murky we just start you know people just presenting things to us like yep that sounds right but not ultimately looking at what are their ulterior motives what are they doing does this really advance um you know what we're trying to do um you know for our children for our community for our future and i, I think it's it's all relevant so i'm really glad that you know we we we're talking about this today and I really hope that people dive deep. When you talk about like what people can do during a pandemic with their families, read Dr. King's letter, mm -hmm, read mm -hmm. it, annotate it, have your, have your children talk about like how they see it. What, and what would it mean if we had real friends in this fight, real white friends, you know, like Thomas Garrett, you know, uh, abolitionist, you know, uh, you know, John Brown, Right. Like what what would it look like? Those are those are great dinner conversations. <laughs> They're practical. And there well, are people out there who maybe who who would be interested in, in working in that way. But we got to we got to call out the, the slicksters. Well, when you think about that, though, what is the answer to that? What would what would if I was watching this right now and I was uh -huh. like saying, like, God damn it, y'all just hammered on me. I'm a white liberal. Uh -huh. I'm sick of your shit. <laughs> I, don't, I don't listen to y'all like and I wake up every day not thinking about how I can kill black people. I wake up every day thinking how I can help uh, and I give money to good causes. I show up to meetings. I do march in the marches. Um, I take crap from family members at Thanksgiving because I'm wearing a BLM T-shirt. Mm -hmm. Right. And here you are. You two Negroes get on this show on a Friday with all this rah rah. With all this rah rah, want to give me a hard time. And I'm out <laughs> here like doing the good white thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And here we are criticizing and critiquing. And if they were to turn it on us and say, OK, yeah, well, then what would I do if I was really true blue? If I was really like if I wanted to really be really down. real, yeah. really down. So what would you say to them? So two things. One, um, I'd remind them about Malcolm's growth. Right. At one point, a white woman came up to Malcolm like, what can I do? Everything that you just said, what can I do? He, he said nothing and walked away. Later, he said, you know what? I actually regret that. What mm -hmm. I, I wish I knew who she was. And, you know, I wrote about this and, in, in, um, you know, before is like, I wish I knew who she was so I could tell her one of the things you could do is get your people. Mm. These are your people. Mm -hmm. And instead of mm -hmm. coming to my church, my place and saying, I'm going to help free you. She said, go back to the person that's holding the gun. Mm -hmm. Go back to the person that's holding up the funds. Go to the person who is holding up the policy and crap. Like fight that, fight that as much. You know what I mean? Like that's what, 
make 90% of your energy there. And then the other part of it is that I was speaking to a teacher earlier this summer on, you know, uh, on this uh, national uh, network of state teachers of the year. One thing she brought up was she's uh, disciplined herself and she holds herself accountable to um, interrogate, to analyze, to assess her privilege every week, mm, mm, every week. Mm, mm, and I was like, Oh, every week. She's like, yeah, because as a white woman navigating America, I pick up new privileges all the time. Mm -hmm, She's mm -hmm. like, so even when I feel like I address something, I, I gave away a position, right? I gave up my seat. I didn't just say, hey, come to the table. And there's really no room, right? We get mm -hmm. invited to a table. It's so crowded. We can't even get there. So we're in the back. You ever go to those conference rooms? They got the seats at the table. Then they got the seats around the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they invite us to the table, but we're really seats on the wall if we get into the room at all. She right. Said, oh, I may give up my seat. Right. And and a person of color sits there. The next thing I know, somebody gave me a seat like in a millisecond afterwards. Mm. It's like I don't analyze that constantly. Then I will still have amassed all this power, all this privilege and saying, yes, I'm with you all. Not mm -hmm. recognizing where I am, what I stand uh, for and where I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. So those would be the two things that I would say to our, you know, our. Our folks who are, you know, allies and want to be con uh, cons co-conspirators who want to take the lead at those marches, you know, and and y'all be the ones that get locked up because you probably won't lose your job. <laughs> you won't you, you probably won't get killed or, mm -hmm. you know, all mm -hmm. those kind of things like, you know, those are those are the ways that you can, um, you know, use your positionality um, mm -hmm. to help advance. Um, but main thing, get your people. I think that's the best advice, actually, because that's where your power is. That's yeah. where you can be used as an agent for change. A mm -hmm. couple of things to address here. You know, um, two of the people uh, in, the, in the timeline here, um, Teach Forever 54 and Joshua, both, you know, <clears throat> um, push back a little bit on my claim about the, the conservatives being honest. And, you know, you have to understand what I'm meaning when I say honest. I don't mean like they're honest uh, in, in their bones as people. I mean, they're honest about how they feel about you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it's like, I don't know if honest is the right word. I'll just put it this way. It's easier for you to understand your position with them. Yeah. <laughs> after like three seconds of dealing with them mm -hmm. versus uh, liberals who takes you much longer to like figure out um, why are there so many knives in my back? Uh -huh. Like I felt so comfortable, but I felt so comfortable and I got like 80 knives in my back. I just don't understand. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, and I'll say this about conservatives, you know, th there is a difference between Republicans and libertarians and conservatives. Those are three different things. Those are three different groups of people. So the analysis is a little too simple on the right to say uh, just the right, because uh, Republicans are partisans to a Republican corporatist platform that is is void oftentimes of principle and the I ideology that libertarians have uh, and that conservatives have. Conservatives are deeply, deeply, deeply educated people um, who have read the major text of the world and take a very conservative view of the world that is uh, informed and philosophical, and you may disagree with it, but it is informed and philosophical. Libertarians are people that are constitutionally based people who believe in the freedom and the liberty of everyone with no excuses, no exceptions. So they are more friendly to things like um, uh, when you have a problem with the police, they are there for you. Libertarians are there for you. When you have a problem with the state, they are there for you. So they are probably the people on the right who are the most, I think, as a libertarian myself, I'll say is are probably the most um, weaponizable, the most agreeable people to, I think, the freedom movement for black folks, because they don't deal with it. They don't appreciate any form of state oppression and they don't love the police and they don't want military militarization of the police in the military. Um, so that there are three different groups on that side of the fence. That can be a totally different show. I just wanted to put that out there. And to your last point that you just made. Um, I always go back to the movie, A Time to Kill. Saw it years ago, and this is the mm. only scene that I remember from it. There's two scenes. One's really gross and horrible, so I won't talk about that scene. Yeah, but there's a, a traumatic movie. Traumatic movie. And towards the end, you know, um, Matthew McConaughey, you know, all right, all right, all right, is the, um, is the lawyer in that movie. And he is um, he's defending Samuel L. Jackson's character. And he... He can't like figure out his strategy with the white jury, an all white jury. And he's trying to make them see this black man's humanity and he's trying to see it through the eyes of the black man and try and get them to, to feel something, you know, about this black man. And at some point, Samuel Jackson is like, 
man, I hired you not to think like me or think about me or whatnot. I hired you because you white. <laughs> think like them. Think like yourself. Think like a white person and then go and do it. And, you know, that's the thing in the movie that makes the art that changes everything. He goes back into there and he thinks like a white person talking to a white jury and he wins the case because now he's not trying to do that thing that white liberals do. He's actually just being practical and saying, I'm white. I know white people. I understand white people. I understand how their power works. So I'm going to I'm going to craft a story based on that. That's the yeah. type of ally we need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, based on that, I want to add to 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 both of our answers. You know, I, I think actually your father answered this question already. Um, and often when I when I think about people like your father and and other people who get who basically said, you know, uh, told you that you know, got to infiltrate and double cross. You know, I often think about that as as black people, like you know, gaining positions of power and and using it for good. You know, but that's actually a message to white people who want to be true allies, mm -hmm. infiltrate and double cross your own people, your own people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That mindset, the, the whiteness, <clears throat> this white supremacy, this, this whole idea of, you know, uh, we're, we're allies, even though you're still, you know, we're going to oppress you, infiltrate and double cross your people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make sure that you're using your, your privilege and power on behalf of, of those that this country has vowed to oppress. I mean, like, listen, um, Carol Burris at Network for Public Education stepped down and let a woman of color take over that that organization. Uh, and don't let it be one who just says all the things that you want them to say. Have it be one who really honestly has black women and black mothers uh, at the, the core of their ideology. I did not yeah. know that. Sure. I'll be watching that closely. Same thing. No, no, no. That. I didn't say that happened. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I didn't like, say that shit happened. No, bro. No, bro. Like, we, we got drunk. That didn't happen. I'm saying that should happen in a, like, in a realistic wow. universe. Listen, That's Carol Burris happen. was going to visit Shoemaker. She was going to visit the legendary shoe crew what, several years ago. She was like, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to come to visit your school because I, I like how you talk about black children, da, da, da. but I also started talking about like, you know, I wasn't just talking about black children. I was also talking about white people. One day she messaged me like, you're a nasty person. I'm not coming to visit your school. I was like, good. Like, well, our kids don't know you. They're not looking for you. You know, they, look they at wait the, look for the privilege in that. They look waiting the for Britney. Exactly. They, yeah, I'm just like, yeah, yo, our kids yeah. want Britney Packnett to come. They want Amir Suleiman to come. That's they right. want they want the Black Panther Party members to come. That's who they're getting excited about. Like, they don't know you, lady. Like, talk about mm -hmm. like, I'm not coming. Oh, oh, you're not going to descend out of the mm -hmm. heavens to our school, white savior? Oh, we're so sorry. Ladies, she get out of here. Me. I said one thing. I can't remember what it was. And it was actually, she mistook it. It was actually positive about her. And she blocked me. This was years ago. Blocked me on Twitter. And I was like, yep, there you go. It's it's the let them eat cake white womanism of, <laughs> of public education. It's the imperial mother. The the It's the house mother. The one who slaps your ass for dropping the China and whatever. Um, and you think she's the sympathetic of the, the white supremacy partnership and marriage between the patriarchal male and the imperial mother. You think she's the more gentle one. She will cut your ass off. She will cut you. She will slap your ass down. She will avoid you from a meeting, uh, get you out of a meeting. She will get you out of a grant. She will get you out of the good favor with the, uh, the population. She will create an organization about public education that only puts people on its board that already are fully demanding domesticated to the house. Mm -hmm. Only domesticated house Negroes will get on that board. So anyways, to use your, I think, uh, philosophy, if you're running an organization like that, quit and put a person of color in charge of it, right? And if they, ha if they have trouble with the board, go to the board and get on the board and tell the board, we're not going to have no trouble with this mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. If you are in a meeting and it's all white moms sitting around drinking wine, boxed wine and shit with asymmetrical haircuts, um, say, this is bullshit. I'm not going to stay in this meeting. Actually, I'm done with this meeting. This meeting's over. This meeting's over. I'm not going to sit in a room full of white women drinking wine, talking about what's best for public education without any of the people that are some of the biggest stakeholders, which are people of color in this meeting. Right. Be actionary about it. Don't don't talk us to death. Uh -huh. You know, walk us to death. Don't talk us to death. Actually, let us see what you're where you're walking with it. Uh -huh. So now we got I know we got to run. Yeah. But I just want to show you what the black mind looks like on. And it comes from your state, bro. This comes from your state, so you're going to have to answer for this. I ain't surprised. But this is what the black mind looks like on liberalism, on white liberalism. This is what it looks like. Uh, yeah. If you ever show up in a T-shirt that says, fuck charter schools, 
and you are talking about 700,000 black children, over a million parents and, and people of color either working in those schools or running those schools or operating those schools for good and ill, because someone's gonna be at home, well, you know, all those schools aren't great anyways. They're all terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you never say that about the other schools, right? So why are all our schools gotta be perfect, right? No, magnet schools aren't perfect. She, does, she doesn't have a shirt that says, fuck magnet schools. Mm -hmm. Even though the magnet schools in Connecticut are turning people away on the basis of being black, because they have a cap of how many black people can be in them. Why is this shirt doesn't say say magnet schools on it or whatnot? But well, I'll tell you why. Because one, Pennsylvania is funded by public employees and their dominant culture, white allies. This in the school to prison pipeline and defend public schools is marketing that comes straight out of public uh, employees. This group that retweeted it down here, Journey for Justice, was created by the Chicago Teachers Union, the public employees, which, by the way, whose president, by the way, right now is a billionaire. Look it up. Google it and, and come back at me. The president of the CTU right now who loves to grab the bullhorn and be standing with black folks in BLM rallies or whatnot as a billionaire out here talking about defend public schools against the rich, right? And journey for justice or whatnot. This is a complete picture of black people on liberalism. And this to me says nothing but fewer choices, fewer options, less pathways and roads out of an oppressive racist system that has held our kids captive for far too long. That's my final word, bro. What's your final word, man? <laughs> that yeah, that was in Pittsburgh, and and again, you know, and Pittsburgh's small, right? And so I, I just I send a message to my friends, like, yo, who's this lady? You know what? They were they. I of course, you know, I knew somebody who knew her, a couple people who knew her, and it's just as you said, like, oh, where does she work? Who's paying her bill? <laughs> and what you know, and what and what this mean? Who she actually is, right? Um, but you know, the applause that she got from white folks, you know, for wearing that shirt in a city that's the worst city for raising black kids, you know, again, like what are you what are you talking about right now? And how does this, you know, as you say, what the Monday morning question, how does this help, you know, grandparents? You know, listen, for all the folks who, you know, who critique, you know, like how we're trying to approach uh black liberation. The eight million black children, the the situations that have been, you know, you know, uh, baked into this the grounds of this uh, educational desert uh, for for so long. And I shouldn't even say we shouldn't even say deserts, right? Because deserts actually have a lot of beautiful things about it. Oh, right? here we go with the geology. Yeah, I'm just saying, what a, you know, like, uh, but but one of the things that you know, Stokely Carmichael quoted somebody and said, you know, what a lot of times the criticism is actually an autobiography. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when, when you're critiquing us, black mm -hmm. people talking about black children and the ways and methods we should do, when you're critiquing us about how we're approaching our own liberation, it's telling something about yourself. Mm. It's betraying your words <laughs> because your words say one thing, but it's betraying that. And it's really revealing your mindset. Right. Mm -hmm. Stop trying to white folks who want to who both allies and enemies. Stop trying to choreograph. Our, our march, our fight. <laughs> like, yeah, y'all want to choreograph it. You know, you want to play, uh, what's the name, Geppetto? You want to be Geppetto. Don't mm -hmm. be Geppetto. Like, we 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 know where we do. Listen to us and infiltrate and double cross your people. Get your people. That's that's the work we got to do. We, we're done with the slow walking that the moderates want to, you know, put, that, put, us on, put us on a leash and do a slow walk around the block and end up in the same place generation after generation after generation. Your slow walk and your slow talk is, is coma inducing, both for us and for you, because <laughs> it paralyzes you as well. And you know what? Anyone who co-signs on that madness, they got to get out of the way. You know, we don't want no parts of it. I love it, man. I mean, this is this is a, a conversation we could keep having, man, <laughs> and it's going to keep coming up. It is. And I think we should actually keep talking about it. Our friends and allies and and uh, folks who are in this conversation with us, the comments here or whatnot. Mm -hmm. I would challenge all of us to keep this on the table, mm -hmm. because if we're going to do a, a real power analysis of who our friends and enemies are, let's get real about that analysis. Let's stop being like kind of surfacey about it. Let's talk real, real talk. Mm -hmm. And when people are coming to us to work with us or to criticize us or whatever, we all need to kind of just like work together on having a mental model that we use when we have that, when we're approached or when we're, we're you know, because we can't all just like be walking around 
thinking we know who our friends and enemies are if we haven't done any power analysis right yeah. now. Yeah. And the one you and I are talking about, no one does. Right. No one does this right now. Uh, I would ch challenge them all uh, all to do it. Anyways, mm -hmm. appreciate you as always, brother. You are so like like the, the the best person to have in a conversation like this because of your your breadth of knowledge and background that you have in in um, you're steeped in things. You have done the research and the study and the reading over time. Um, and I just love it. This is like no, the best thing I do every week. Yeah, no, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for for the platform and and thanks for the wealth that you bring. You know, the, those aren't just decorations behind you. You know, you can you you can tell when people are not only like you know because some people are, some people know those ebony towers you talk about are also well read, but they're not connected to you know the people and the circumstances that that our people find themselves in generations after generations because they've removed themselves or they removed their immediate families and they've yeah. forgotten. And so I appreciate. Uh, people like you who've who've seen how the sausages are made as a school board you bring your um intelligence as a black parent and then you also bring your intelligence as, as a black man in the in these uh you know in these streets and in these war rooms so i, I just appreciate it and i appreciate freedom fridays uh, tremendously i'm looking forward to next week we got dr greg carr mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. those who don't know look the brother up africana car c-a-r-r -R, on on twitter um, he leads the uh, African American Studies Department at HU Howard University, and we're excited to have him on. Uh, you know, next week to continue our conversations about, uh, you know, Black liberation and Freedom Fridays. Mm. Great place to stop. So, friends, family, people watching this, uh, who have once again given us an hour of your time on a Friday. I appreciate you and uh, you go forth and be free this weekend. You go uh, go forth and free your mind, free your thoughts um, so that you start next week out ready to fight for these eight million black children with all the strength that God gives you to be able to do it. So just consider this like your your laundromat. Mm -hmm. You know, we just laundered you on a Friday. Now go forth, get clean over the weekend mentally and come back on Monday and do some real damage.